microphone with the green light on so that uh, folks watching online can, can hear what you have to say. Um, first off, uh, to introduce myself, my name is Ian Wallace. I'm the director of the Cybersecurity Initiative here at New America. Um, the Cybersecurity uh, Initiative here is now getting on for four years old. Uh, we're supported by a number of funders, particularly the Hewlett Foundation uh, and a partnership with Florida International University, who we uh, uh, work with on a, a number of different sort of cybersecurity issues and are very pleased to, to, to do so. Um, there are many things that I'm proud of uh, in relation to our initiative, uh, but three of them in particular are focusing on topics that other people uh, are not focused on. Um, our fellows program, and our, our partnerships with other organizations. And this topic brings together all three of those strands very nicely. Um, as we will discuss, um, I think city cybersecurity is an emerging issue, but it's one that probably hasn't had the uh, attention that it deserves. And, and part of this uh, exercise uh, is to, to, to draw a little bit of that attention and expose some of the work that particularly uh, Natasha Cohen, who you'll meet shortly, uh, has been doing in researching uh, how, how the, the, the policy uh, issues around this topic uh, are evolving. Um, Natasha is herself one of our uh, cybersecurity fellows uh, and uh, it's a testament to uh, that program that, that we're able to, to, to do this work uh, which uh, also includes other fellows, including uh, Brian Nussbaum at the State University of New York in Albany, uh, and Emma Fergawu, who's uh, now based in Oxford, but previously was working for us on, on state and local issues. Um, but the, the um, panel we have, uh, and uh, partnerships, I should say, uh, we're doing this event uh, in partnership with the National Governors Association, and they're very pleased to do so. So to um, introduce a fantastic panel, uh, I'm gonna uh, talk to them uh, 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 briefly, ask them a few questions, have a moderated discussion, and then uh, open this up to questions uh, from the floor. Um, the, uh, the panel we have to discuss this cover uh, a, a range of different perspectives, and I think we'll get a pretty rich sense of, of, of what the issues are. Um, sitting immediately uh, to uh, next to me, uh, we have Jacob Finn, who is the policy manager for Meg Garcetti in uh, Los Angeles, uh, covering his uh, cybersecurity portfolio. And LA is one of the uh, cities that's um, been particularly active uh, on cybersecurity. Uh, and we'll hear a little bit more of that and what it might mean for, for, for others. Uh, sitting next to Jacob, we have Karen Jackson, who uh, now runs her own firm, uh, Apogee Strategy Partners, uh, but until recently uh, was uh, the Secretary of Technology for the Commonwealth of Virginia and has uh, herself done quite a lot of pioneering work in how states interact with cities uh, and uh, more generally how cybersecurity works um, uh, outside of the, the federal government. Sitting next to her, we have uh, our uh, colleague and collaborator, Michael Garcia, who is uh, the National Governors Association's uh, liaison uh, on these cybersecurity is issues with uh, governor's offices across the the US and then certainly in the last couple of years has been uh, leading a pretty active uh, effort on behalf of the National Governors Association to, to, to get cyber policy discussed um, outside of the, the, the beltway. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, we have Natasha Cohen, who my colleague here at New America, who leads our um, state and local cybersecurity work, uh, currently focused on a paper looking at cybersecurity and particularly incident response at the, the city level. Uh, she has a, a background in, in the private sector uh, and uh, various other um, sort of policy related jobs. So brings a, a, a great deal of uh, additional knowledge to this. Um, so as I say, I'm gonna um, kick this off uh, with uh, a question to each of the panelists and then we're gonna go into a, a moderated discussion um, I uh, remind you that uh, this uh, event's being live streamed, so be careful what you say when we get to the Q&A. Uh, and uh, um, if uh, 
anyone is interested in following uh, uh, this through Twitter, uh, the uh, New America uh, uh, Twitter account is at New Am Cyber, uh, and will occasionally be uh, capturing our, our great thoughts for, for um, the Twitterati. Um, so, um, Jacob, uh, actually, no, Natasha, I'm going to come to you first. Why is this an important discussion? And why do we think it's important to bring together people from different, uh, different governments, different uh, uh, perspectives to, to weigh in on the, the cybersecurity of cities? Yeah, thank, thanks, Ian. And, and also thank you to the panelists for, for coming here to, to join us, um, talk to each one of you before, and, and really value you know, your expertise. So I think it's going to be a, gr a great discussion. And you know, the importance of cities, I think, lies in the element that cities are our form of government that are closest to the citizens. Right? The, these are the governments that are providing services directly to the citizens day to day. So there's a, a real emphasis on resilience and rapid recovery and a look at cybersecurity less from a, a wall perspective and more from a service provider perspective. There's also the, the fundamental aspect of citizen cybersecurity. And I think we're starting to see that percolate, you know, percolate through, whether that's federal government, state government, but city government, really that's, that's the core of it. How do we provide a secure environment for our citizens, both for what they do on the internet, what they do on their devices, services that are provided to them, and ensure that they are provided without an interruption. Um, and then I think the last point that I want to just draw to you on this is the range of maturity of cities, because cities can be, you know, a small, small city where the resources may be um, pretty strapped. And they can also have medium, large side cities that also have resourcing issues, but have a very wide range of expertise, a base, um, and, and sometimes function more like a state, uh, which, you know, a discussion that we were having earlier, where some of the larger cities are, are in fact larger than many of the states. And so I think for that reason, it's important to bring in the expertise of folks um, that work at the state level and, you know, not only for how states work with cities directly, but how large government organizations can manage these kind of initiatives um, at the local, you know, sub-federal level government. So with that, Ian, I'll turn it back over to you. Fantastic. Well, the obvious place to start when you're having a conversation about cities would seem to be someone who actually works in a city. So. Um, <laughs> Jacob, um, LA has been a sort of pioneer in this space. Uh, and, you know, to pick up Natasha's theme, you know, LA is bigger than some countries uh, and uh, certainly has a, a, a great deal of complexity. Can you just give us a sense of um, what you've been doing in LA and um, to the extent that, um, that there can be lessons, what lessons that might offer to, to other cities who are beginning to grapple with the, the cyber security? Security challenge. Of course. Well, first, thank you very much to New America for having us. Uh, Mayor Garcetti asked me to send his best wishes to everyone here. Um, Mayor Garcetti, Eric Garcetti, came into office in 2013, and the second executive directive that he signed, basically akin to a presidential order, is that cybersecurity be a public function of city government. So, whereas our constituents pay taxes for their fire services, police services, EMS, cybersecurity is also something that they should be receiving as a public function of government. Um, that's what the executive directive, uh, the theme of it was. What the executive directive ordered was collaboration among city departments dealing with cybersecurity. Uh, I'll tell you, today we have about 41 or 42 city departments um, maybe 40,000 employees who handle endpoints, have a computer or email, a phone in some way. And basically the 41 departments are split as follows. About 39 departments fall under our city's information technology agency, under the networks of the ITA. And then we have three proprietary departments, departments that bring in their own revenue and sources. Uh, Department of Water and Power, Los Angeles World Airport, so that, that includes LAX and Burbank, and then the Port of Los Angeles. And what was happening before this executive directive is that each of these four uh, entities were, were managing their own cybersecurity programs. 
in a way, the information sharing was siloed. When Department of Water and Power, for example, saw a threat, an indicator on one of their networks, they would handle it accordingly, but they wouldn't notify the airport or the port or any of the other of uh, Los Angeles's agencies. So there wasn't that communication. And what this executive directive did was it created an intergovernmental body for information sharing, for situational awareness and threat intelligence. Um, I could go on a little bit more basically uh, through a grant that the city received, uh, Urban Area Security Initiative Grant. We were able to build up an integrated security operations center one that would... And that grant was from where? Sorry? That grant was from where? Who provided the grant? The Cyber Intrusion Command Center, which was the intergovernmental body. Um, actually, if you don't mind, maybe I'll read a couple lines from the executive directive that I think capture the purpose um, and what Mayor Garcetti was going for with this. So what the Cyber Intrusion Command Center is, all city departments, including proprietary departments, will participate in a collaborative effort known as the Cyber Intrusion Command Center, and it shall consist of all city departments led by the Office of the Mayor, and shall incorporate assistance from the FBI, the US Secret Service, the Department of Homeland Security. Um, the cybersecurity goals of this group are to facilitate the identification and remediation of cyber threats, to ensure incidents are quickly and efficiently responded to, to ensure awareness of best practices, to provide uniform governance across the city, et cetera, sponsor independent security assessments. And it is required that every single government entity in Los Angeles contribute to this effort. It's not allowed that any, if a government, if a entity in our city knows something related to cyber, you know, a cyber threat, that they keep it from the CICC. And that working body was what led to the development of our integrated security operations center. There's a lot there that I want to dig yeah, into, well, and um, I'm sure um, we will pick up some yeah. threads, which, uh, well, some others will pick up some of those threads. But just for now, I want to go and um, uh, bring in some of the other panelists. Um, I'm going to come first to you, Michael. Um, the NGA has been very active in cybersecurity in the last few years, and um, to state the obvious, uh, many people uh, who, who live in states, uh, live in cities, uh, and therefore governors have a real interest in um, city level cybersecurity. Could, can you just give us a, you also personally get an opportunity to sort of travel around the country and see some of this. Um, can, can you just give a sort of NGA perspective on uh, what you're seeing around the country as, as mayors and others get to grips with uh, their cybersecurity challenges? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and first off, you know, really looking forward to this conversation. I think I really want to kind of dig into what you're getting at. Um, so I'm a senior policy analyst at NGA. And just for a quick background for those of you who are unfamiliar with NGA, um, we're really two organizations in one. So we have our Office of Government Relations, which advocates on behalf of governors um, to the administration, Congress, and uh, the federal uh, agencies, if you will. Then I sit within the Center for Best Practices, which is really a mix between a think tank and consultancy agency, where we go um, and visit state officials to help them with policy issues that they're having. So we have five divisions within NGA, health, education, economic opportunity, which is really workforce development, um, energy, environment, and transportation, it's all one division. And in my division is Homeland Security and Public Safety. So in my division, uh, I focus on cybersecurity, among other issues, but I'm privileged enough to go to states and work with folks, such as Karen, to help them out with cybersecurity challenges of the day. So I get to meet with state chief information officers, state chief information security officers, um, adjutant generals, uh, homeland security advisors, folks like that who touch cybersecurity, which nowadays is really everyone. And that's the approach that we take that. This is really a whole state, whole government, really a whole ecosystem approach. Um, you'll notice that I really didn't mention any local representatives or agencies, and that's for a purpose. Um, really what we've seen, and, and I can really only speak to since I've been there, I've been there now for about three and a half years, states are really primarily focused with really getting their own house in order, um, developing cybersecurity strategies, developing statewide disruption response plans, and really, and I think key and foremost is governance. Um, I'm sure Karen talked about this, but a lot of states were forming uh, cybersecurity committees, 
task forces, um, things of that nature, just to get a grapping of what they can do. And this isn't to say they weren't thinking about locals. They're actually really concerned about locals. And the thing that whenever I ask them, you know, how are you engaging locals? It's that, well, we don't even know where to begin. There's not enough capacity. And I think the key word of this conversation really is going to be capacity. Right? And really, it, it's workforce development. I, I personally believe that workforce development is the key crux, um, main challenge that we'll have in the near term, medium term, and long term when it comes to cybersecurity. But as a result, um, you see some states are doing some really innovative things when it comes to reaching out to locals and trying to engage them. Um, I'll touch on four very briefly, and then we can kind of delve into any of them that you all are really interested in. Um, so first off, um, in Michigan, they created the Cyber Civilian Corps, which is really akin to a volunteer fire department but for cybersecurity. So basically, they have 50 uh, private individuals um, who are information security professionals who have been vetted by the state of Michigan and they're deployed all throughout Michigan and who could be activated when the governor declares a state of emergency and they can assist uh, a local entity, a private entity, academia, so on and so forth. Um, I do not know if they've been activated, so I can't really answer that question, but I can, here we go. Uh, but I can definitely, we can talk more about that um, if you guys are interested. Um, secondly, we're working very closely with Indiana right now um, through a, a project that we call Policy Academy, which basically we're working a year-long initiative with them to help them with a particular issue. And what they're really interested in is creating a risk assessment tool for locals, specifically really small entities, not necessarily LA size, but those counties where the IT security person is just literally one person and that's just 25% of their job. So how do you assist those individuals just grappling what's on their network, how they assess the threat, and then what they can do to mitigate that threat. So that's one thing that they're developing, and hopefully they'll be wanting to share that um, with the rest of their, their state counterparts. And I know a lot of them will be very interested in that. Um, thirdly, and this one that I think is really interesting, is that Missouri in partnership with University of Michigan is working on a uh, public vul vulnerability disclosure program. And they're using open source code to identify known vulnerabilities within locals, uh, academia, and private sector, and basically reaching out to those individuals and saying, hey, by, by the way, you have this known vulnerability, you should probably patch it up. Now, they're not actually going out and patching that uh, known vulnerability, but they're starting that conversation and forging those relationships. Um, and on their website, they have a lot more information on it, and we can kind of talk about that as well. And last but not least, and I'll end on this note, it's just plain information sharing. Um, you see a lot of states who are creating integration centers, which are really ISALs, where the state is reaching out to locals, locals reaching out to the state, and just sharing threat information and other forms of information. I know California has um, the CALSIC um, that Governor Brown signed as a order back in 2015, 2016 timeframe. Um, and I know that's a really good way that state's been using to really start forging those partnerships with their locals. So a lot of interesting thing going on um, at the state level, reaching out to locals. And I really think that having that partnership is pretty key and crucial when it comes to this. Um, we can delve into each one of those four and we probably will do it in a moment. But, but um, we, since we have Karen here who can um, speak to actually doing this uh, 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 and um, particularly um, doing it in a uh, under administration that's been heavily focused on cybersecurity, as I'm sure she'll tell us. Um, what, what lessons did you draw from your time in Virginia about the way in which states can uh, enable uh, cities to, to be uh, more effective in, in supporting their cybersecurity? And um, not just in Virginia, but around the country, what, what are the things that you saw that, that deserve more attention uh, and potentially more, more resources? Yeah, thanks for having me here. Obviously, I'm going to echo what the other two panelists have said. Um, I think just from, from a starting point, it, it's obvious how confusing this landscape is. You got ISAOs and ISACs, and you got city led initiatives and state led initiatives and federal led initiatives, and just trying to sort through the who, the what, the where, and the how can be immensely confusing. Um, we've had a lot of conversations recently about election security um, at the federal level, the state level, and the local level. And I, I think it was Natasha, you mentioned that 
as you move these initiatives down, you have to realize that ultimately the citizen is in the local level. So if something happens to them, they're probably their first touch point is going to be somebody in the locality. Um, I have to admit, most of those that have bubbled up um, to our attention when we were still in office, and I served Governor McCall dur during his entire term, and he was the chairman of the National Governors Association, where we launched um, the cyber initiative with NGA called States Confront the Cyber Challenge. It was called Meet the Threat. And so what we quickly learned was that everybody along that chain has to figure out how they respond and how they react when there's a problem. But it's not just about waiting until there's a problem to, to react. You have to be proactive in how you guard your own networks, how your networks interconnect with other people's networks, how do citizens interconnect with you. Um, and so some of the lessons that we, we learned was that, you know, and I think the biggest takeaway really truly is that you can do everything that you can do to secure yourself. But when you start to interconnect with other people, if they're not doing what they need to be doing to keep themselves safe, whether that's a private sector partner, another governmental partner, a university, doesn't matter. If your networks are interconnected, their problem becomes your problem. And so it's not just incumbent on you to worry about securing yourself. It's truly incumbent on you to help everybody, whether it's in your supply chain, your contact chain, your sphere of influence, if you're in government, you, it's in your best interest to try to help each and every step along that pathway become as secure as they can be. We've, you know, have, it's been mentioned about the size of the IT staff. I would hasten to say that LA's staff, we had about 100,000 state employees, so we were slightly larger. But govern, governors particularly have to make a choice on whether they have to make a decision. It's not necessarily a choice because you can do both, and that's what we opted to do is are you going to focus on securing your own infrastructure or are you going to try to combine that work with also looking at the economic development benefits of building cyber security as an industry within your state what assets do you have to bring to bear how are you going to use those workforce was mentioned there's going to be a massive shortage of cyber security workers and there already is virginia when we left office was about thirty-six thousand. IT worker, well, cybersecurity workers specifically down as of January. So we were down 36,000 employees. You can't churn out workers quickly enough. We were looking at veterans. We were looking at students. We were looking at mid-career changers. We were trying to find anybody that had a proclivity that wanted to go into cyber and try to get them into a program that would work. And so specifically with our cities and municipalities, we actually activated our National Guard. We decided that it was important enough for us to bring in the resources that we had to bear to help those that may not be able to help themselves. And so having the ability to bring the National Guard in to do engagements with their, with their communities, they would self-identify. We didn't force anybody to do it. It was a self-selection process. Gave them additional eyes, gave them additional hands to try to help them know what they needed to do better. We all know cybersecurity is not inexpensive. And so for some of these smaller jurisdictions that maybe they have one person full time, or maybe they have the kid that comes in on the weekend or a volunteer that helps them take care of it, you have to try to provide them with as many resources as you can because going back to my first statement about you're only as safe as your weakest link, they connect back to the state and they connect back to the state in a lot of ways. Um, we also went on a pretty heavy, uh, public awareness campaign, cybersecurity became a part of every conversation that we had. Whether it was economic development or whether it was IT, just in general, it became part of the conversation. So you're looking at elections, what are you doing about cybersecurity? You're looking at economic development, what are you doing about cybersecurity? You're looking at doing autonomous vehicles, what are you doing about cybersecurity? So it became a natural part of a conversation that just wasn't there before. And we found that people then started to become more comfortable with the conversation, but they also knew that they had a lot of, of learning that they still needed to do. So I think we brought, bringing in the guard was a big thing that we did. The elections, obviously we were knit hand in glove with federal agencies, state agencies, as well as the locals, trying to make sure that that process was, was done seamlessly and safely. Um, and really truly 
just integrating the cybersecurity into the conversation so that people felt comfortable asking questions and trying to figure out what they didn't know. Um, if you look at smart communities, which I think we're going to touch on a little bit, um, the idea of connecting depends on which estimate you want to look at, 20 billion devices by 2020 that are going to be connected. All of those are vectors for potential ne'er-do-wells. And so you look at that, each one of those is connected to a network that's connected to somebody else's network. And so there's a lot of education that has to go on, both at the citizen level as well as all levels of government to make sure that we're, we're capable of handling the threat when we have a workforce issue and when there's a lot of people around the globe that are laser focused on trying to do, do bad things to good people. So I'll stop there. There are several fantastic things there. Uh, the threat is one, um, but another is resources uh, that are available to um, mayors and, and uh, city managers. Um, states clearly one set of resources. Um, uh, bringing in their own expertise is, is clearly another. Um, but we shouldn't forget, uh, as we sit here in Washington, D.C., that the federal government um, does have a role to play in, in supporting cities directly. Um, you've been doing some work on this, Natasha. Well, what contribution can, should, um, may in the future the, the federal government play as cities start to grapple with uh, the emerging channels, challenges of smart cities and uh, increasing amounts of data, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, thanks, Ian. And, and I, I'm going to touch on some themes that we've already heard from the other three panelists, which I, which I think is great because it's obviously a discussion that, that feeds into itself. Um, and we're all talking about you know, similar, similar issues. Um, I'm gonna break down the federal government's assistance to cities into three categories and, and just give a, a brief overview as to what the government's doing now. I'm not gonna touch on every single program because we'd be here all afternoon, um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give some, some highlights. And the, the three categories are, uh, we have a uh, quick note, pause while we have a uh, cell phone, there we go. Um, and, and the three categories are uh, resilience, security, and as a function of security, uh, recovery. And on the security side, that is the, the actual defense of networks. Um, first of all, a wide apparition, uh, apparatus for information sharing, um, a lot of which flows up through um, the NTIC at, at DHS and, and down through the um, ISACs and ISAOs, the information sharing analysis centers, information sharing and analysis organizations. And when you're talking about state and local organizations, particularly the multi-state you know, information sharing and analysis center, the MSISAC, um, that has a, a network of sensors around the country, um, both in state governments, yes, but also now in, in city networks as well, and many, many counties and cities that are members of the MSISAC, so receive you know, the information that, are, that is shared through those channels. Um, another one is, you know, for the defense itself is funding. And you know, we already heard from, from Jacob that, you know, LA has been able to use some sources of funding from the government. Um, one of those being the, the uh, UASI funds through FEMA and, and DHS, which is part of the Homeland Security Grant Program, um, that has actually this year required there to be cybersecurity spending as a function of that grant, um, and, and to engage the, the technology folks within the state in the the council or the panel or however the state decides um, what the bid is going to be back to FEMA um, for those grants. There are other grants from DHS, such as the founding of um, ISAOs at the regional level that have been used by cities. I, you know, we had a great conversation about that a couple of weeks ago, uh, which is great to hear, right? Because you know, they, it's great that the grants are out there. It's even better when we hear them actually being implemented in a, in a way that obviously sees benefit um, for cities. So, you know, I'll definitely let Jacob talk about that a, a little while. Um, and then looking at um, recovery. So when it, I know after an incident actually occurs, the, there's a couple of different teams that all have resources for cities to, to use um, after they have an incident. And that includes the NKIC itself um, that has a, a team that can go out and either do direct incident response and, and help them with the recovery um, or provide advice into how to manage the event um, themselves. The uh, MSISAC also has a team that does similar work, either on-site or, or virtually. Um, FEMA as well can be deployed to help with, with an incident, um, a lot on the coordination. And, and there's a team right now, uh, an upcoming report from RAND, 
uh, where they're actually looking at that. So what, what is the role of FEMA as, as events are, are starting to get, you know, larger, more, more and more systems are being networked. We're, we're realizing that, you know, these events can spread. Um, and then also, you know, on, on the other side, there's the FBI and the Secret Service that are there to really figure out what occurred, um, how it occurred, and to take the law enforcement side of that investigation, while the, the folks on the DHS side really do the, the asset management and, and recovery from an incident. And then on the resilience side, so the preparing for incidents, um, a large number of federal resources that are devoted to exercises. And that can be, you know, DOD-led exercises, DHS-led exercises. There are a number of states that are using um, the National Guard to do uh, actual testing on systems, whether that's critical infrastructure or state systems themselves. Unfortunately, it's very state by, on a very state-by-state state basis. Um, the legalities of how you activate the Guard, whether that's for state service or federal service, um, and in, even within a state, what they're allowed to do depends you know, largely on that state. And so that's definitely something that is still in, in development and in motion, but we're seeing it happen more and more often. Um, the, the DHS uh, apparatus also does a, a large number of testing, whether that's through um, NKIC that, that does a lot of the hardcore you know, penetration testing risk assessments or the cybersecurity advisor program that also does assessments with state and local governments. Um, and, and those assessments are, are free, right? So that, that's a huge resource that, that cities can take advantage of no matter if they're you know, small or, or large. So you know, that, that's the overview of what the federal government's doing. I think you know, there's some areas that we'd like to see improvement, particularly in funding. Um, having cybersecurity tied to the federal funding process on Homeland Security funding ties it to counterterrorism. Um, and that's something we can delve into to later. I'm not gonna go you know, down the rabbit hole on that, um, but that's definitely something that I think we should pick up at some point. Um, in talking about, you know, how the federal government helps state and locals and, and how we can improve this process um, going forward as, you know, folks are maturing in, in their governance structures and their processes, their procedures at all three levels of government. Thank you very much, Natasha. And we'll, we'll definitely dig into sort of some of those um, resource questions. And I sort of um, mean resources sort of writ large. But before we do, um, I'd like to just dig into sort of what threats we think we're talking about. Uh, we often talk about the cybersecurity challenge without actually being very specific about uh, what it is uh, individual um, uh, actors in the system need to worry about. Um, coming back to you, Jacob, you know, as, as you um, advise sort of Meg Arsetti on what, what his priorities ought to be, uh, and, and work with others uh, in the city. Um, what, what among the, the, the various different threats out there are you most concerned about? I'm thinking sort of, you know, balancing sort of the, the challenges of increasingly smart cities, um, elections, as we've heard, you know, interruptions of services, um, the ransomware attack in, in Atlanta, theft of data, you know, cities hold enormous amount of um, personally identifiable information. What, 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 is it that, uh, what is it that you think mayors ought to be focused on and, and where are they getting the information about um, how to balance those threats? Sure. I think the number one issue that cities, or I'll speak to Los Angeles to begin with, uh, are focusing on is employee security. So the human error part of the equation, uh, it's said that some 90% of attacks on businesses and governments are due to human error, to a employee clicking on a phishing email and allowing malware and viruses into uh, the, their networks. Um, we have made that a number one priority for the city. So by, uh, requiring mandatory training for our employees across, across the city. Um, by taking part in National Cybersecurity Awareness Month and educating both our employees and the wider community on best practices for surfing in the web and navigating the internet, and email security, endpoint protection. Uh, so number one, I would say, is the human factor. 
Number two, you started to touch upon it is smart cities. And Los Angeles, as you know, uh, looking towards the next 10 years is planned to become this smart city metropolis uh, in America. And we are planning, you know, in the next 10 years, we're gonna have uh, probably a Super Bowl and the World Cup and the Olympics in 2028. So we, as we move towards a smart city uh, based on transportation, you know, updating our transportation and rolling out 5G and small cell, small cell technology, uh, one of the things that the mayor and our, our city planners need to focus on is the security of uh, new application of new technologies that we roll out. And, and I should have said this out myself, but I'll, I'll turn it into a question for you. When we talk about smart cities, what is it that we're really talking about? What is it, what is it that um, LA thinks it needs to protect? Sure. It's anything connected to the internet. Um, when we're talking about autonomous vehicles in the future or um, e-vehicles, we want to meet goals, for example, uh, by 2050 to become carbon neutral. Uh, when we do that, we're going to be rolling out new technologies that need to be secure. I mean, is that answer? Yeah. Uh, anything that remotely touches on the internet needs to be secure. And uh, I'll get into the private sector at some point too, but as more and more companies put out the smart refrigerator and the smart toaster and all of these devices that are connected to the internet, we need to be sure that when we adopt these technologies for the city, um, we're doing it uh, based on best cybersecurity practices. Aaron, sitting from where you used to sit, and now I'm sure you um, are advising uh, people based on that experience, what, what do you think are the, the, the threats that um, cities are, are least focused on that, that, that could be uh, coming to bite them. Sure, so I, I think where we left off was I agreed with the whole idea of the human element being um, one of the things that we have to continually care and feed um, because there's generally um, someone somewhere who is gonna click on the next greatest offer that appears in their inbox. And so we constantly have to work on that. Um, and quite frankly, the, the hackers are taking advantage of that because they're becoming much better at the way they present themselves. And so that's gonna to continue to be an issue. We're still gonna to have to continue with things like ransomware, uh, other ne'er-do-wells, the denial of service attacks. But those are, those are starting to be something that we have seen and can start to get our heads around. I think the things that we really have to look at is the physical security now. We're starting to talk about the internet of things, um, whether it's driverless cars, a lot of these devices that are going to be involved in smart cities are, are durable goods. They're not IT purchases. And so we really have to start paying attention to how those devices are secured. I know in Virginia, a lot of our durable goods are purchased by the Department of General Services. If they're IT services, they're purchased by our IT procurement department. One has cybersecurity standards, one doesn't. And so as we start to become more and more networked, those two, the purchasing of those two, at least for this, from the standards perspective, are gonna to have to start to converge. That's uncharted territory. We did have, you know, you start to look at what we're seeing with chips that are being brought in, uh, in devices, in manufactured devices that we purchase, that the states purchase, that the federal government purchase, localities purchase them. Um, and we're gonna to have to truly start applying some significant pressure to the suppliers to make sure that they, the, whether it's a device or whether it's something you know, large like a traffic camera or traffic light, anything that's purchased, we're gonna have to make sure that those manufacturers are applying good solid cybersecurity. And I'm not, I've never been a fan of this, but practicing good cyber hygiene, um, both on their side as well as doing some, potentially doing some stand up and testing before we go live with some of these products to make sure that they're securable and they are secure. So uh, I think that's the next big wave that we're all gonna have to deal with. We've kind of gotten pretty good at dealing with the ones and the zeros. Um, but when you start to think about some of those dur durable goods that are purchased, anything that touches the network is fair game. That includes health equipment, which is particularly frightening. 
um, but the grid financial systems, but it's, it's the things that we don't think about the HVAC systems and others that we haven't spent a lot of time securing that we're really going to have to apply a, a strong eye to now. It's, it, we're on, it's almost too late. So that's, that's a lot to worry about. If, uh, for even the federal government and uh, companies who have significant resources. Um, if you're um, uh, a relative, uh, the uh, mayor or city manager or staff of a, a medium sized city, even, um, how. Um, how. Yes, um, how uh, just a little bit of interference which will uh, which will do it um how, how do we uh, natasha um expect uh mayors to to get the information they need to to manage those threats and what resources are out there uh michael perhaps you can come in on this um are available to to, to people in positions of authority <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, I think when we're talking about cities, we have to, to remember two, two things, that they're going to be always the targets and the targets of opportunity. Um, and, and they're the targets because, you know, they have valuable information, they're close to citizens, they hold, hold citizen data, um, they have a high need to recover those, those services, um, and the visibility of attacking them is, is pretty great. Um, because, you know, they, they're going to have to inform their citizens. And so they, they need those resources and they need those resources, you know, pronto. Um, they have, you know, cities have partners that span across the federal government, span across states, the private sector, and nonprofits. And when we're talking about the federal government, I talked about some of those before, whether that's resiliency or recovery, um, you know, you can rely on some of those resources to help with, with those efforts. Uh, when you're talking about states and, and state efforts, uh, you know, Michael highlighted some of them. Um, you know, I, I'd, Add, add a couple to that, right? You know, you have Arizona that has an, a regional ISAO. Many city governments are, are members of that so that they can get additional information that's cross-sector. Um, San Diego also has a, a regional ISAO. Uh, a number of cities are, are building these or, or states are building them um, to, to share information between their private sector partners um, and public sector partners, the state and the city. And so can you just explain in a little bit more detail what, what an ISAO is, what it does, <laughs> how it can be helpful. Sure, so an information sharing and analysis organization is an organization that's a nonprofit that exchanges information. And whether that's through um, a relatively informal means where you have you know, a CISO council um, that comes together and, and meets, or if that's a more formal threat intelligence platform that is used to share information or, or automated indicator sharing, um, it can really span those different areas. Uh, but it, it, the basic premise is that it enables the exchange of information for security purposes between the members of that ISAO. And whether that's a, a topical ISAO um, or ISAC that's focused on one particular industry or a regional focus where it's exchange of information, that the advantage of a regional focus is that you have that person-to-person -person, um, collaboration. So you can actually bring people together to meet face-to-face, -face and, and it's much more comfortable for folks to share information uh, when they know each other. Um, when we're talking about, you know, other, other resources, universities, a lot of cities have, you know, higher education resources that they can help with, um, whether it's workforce development or partnerships. Uh, an example from, from a state that I think would be a really in, uh, a great model for, for cities to look into is Vermont is starting a partnership with Norwich to, to have uh, students start to, to uh, staff their security operations center. Um, so that, that's been done in some other places, but that, that's now, you know, building a, a contract in that area. Um, when talking about nonprofits, whether it's the ISACs or ISAOs or um, other, or, you know, educational institutions within the state, uh, private sector as well. You know, the states, cities can reach out to their private sector partners for, you know, help on, on security, whether that's through a, a managed security service provider or, you know, incident response. But it, you know, when it comes to incident response, I think something that we've heard again and again from, from both the private sector folks and, and the public sector folks is that it's important to build those relationships and those partnerships before an incident happens. Um, you know, so you want to build those, those partnerships, at least you know, at, the, at the minimum a contract or conversation at, at the high end, you know, actually working with folks actively, uh, whether that's you know, the National Guard and making sure that they have um, you know, 
basic stuff, logons. So if you know if something happens in an incident, they're they're not you know trying to build you know spin up um, accounts right after an incident. They they're familiar with the systems. They've sat there. They've worked with people. They they know who they are um, and and can really have that dialogue when when and if an incident occurs. Um, Mike, one of the things that um, I know um, states have begun to uh, explore is um, sort of picking up Natasha's theme, um, rehearsing for for incidents and and preparing. Um, what what sort of lessons do you think um, can be learned there that that cities like LA can can and you know relatively uh, big cities, but also um, smaller cities can can learn from the the journey that states have been on in the last few years? Yeah, no, I think that's really spot on because I think going back to the resources, one of the primary resources are the various and numerous amounts of federally run exercises that states and even locals can part participate in. And we actually um, are part of um, a DOE's Grid X exercise that occurs every two years. And so Grid X4 just occurred. And I think one of the greatest lessons learned that I saw was not making assumptions. And this was really between the state, federal, and private sector clear industry, but it wasn't necessarily, the conversation was, well, I thought the state was going to do that. Well, I thought the private sector was going to do that. And it was just this, you know, who's on first base kind of ordeal. And it was actually really interesting in that people assumed, and it was to Natasha's point, they're making those business card contacts during the incident and not beforehand. And they didn't necessarily exercise for externalities. Um, and it's really thinking outside the box, right? Going back to the Nyla report, that was one of the key recommendations, right? We have to make sure that we're thinking outside the box, thinking what's, what's the next threat out there that we're not thinking of. And I think that's one thing that cities and states can learn from is that how can we make sure that we're leveraging each other's resources, we're not duplicating efforts, and that we are redundant as well. Um, I would, we, we advocate to states that they should definitely be playing with their locals to see what resources they need. But at the same time, um, it goes back to the capacity issue in that running exercise is very difficult. Um, and that's where federal government plays a really key role is um, hosting those exercises. So I'd be curious to hear more from you really and see if you all play any exercise and you know what you all expect from state government because I know um, I mean you guys are larger than many many of the states and the states themselves are struggling with that as currently. But, yeah. Jacob does LA run it uh, a sort of regular cybersecurity exercise? Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you, every year we participate in trainings and exercises with the U.S. Secret Service, for example. They come in and we'll do a tabletop exercise and we'll choose some critical asset. Maybe it's the Port of L.A. or um, Southern California, a, a gas plant. And what the steps, what steps would, uh, have, basically the, the, the stages of the incident, um, notifying law enforcement, working with our state and federal partners on resolving an incident, and then also working with the private sector uh, holders of critical infrastructure as well. So we do incorporate them in a yearly exercise. And and just I'm going to open this up to the floor soon, but um, just to, to two more questions from me. One is just to sort of pick up on this theme of uh, collaboration and coordination. Um, Obviously, it is much better to learn from other people's misfortune than your own. And, um, but also, there is a, an element of um, you know, pooling resources to, to deal with threats that individual uh, cities can't deal with on their own. Um, Karen, you may have a, a perspective on this, but I know Natasha's thought about it. Um, what what um, progress have we seen in um, pooling of resources to to help cities deal with some of the challenges that, that they face. Sure, and I want to give a shout out to the National Governors Association actually because they have a cyber resource center that has lots. I don't know how much anymore. <laughs> We've kind of lost lost track of it, but there's lots of information there that would be applicable to whether it's a city, a county, a town, a state. Um, you can see copies of executive orders. You can see all different types of, of resources. I, I'm, I'm not gonna try to categorize them any farther than that, um, that are available. And so 
that's a national treasure trove that you know everybody should feel free to get in and dive around because I think the thing to realize is you're not in this alone. There are people there that can help you. There are people there that will come to your aid. I know our chief information security officer meets regularly with chief information security officers from around the state. It's a voluntary meeting. We don't force anybody to attend, but obviously those that come from the municipalities, we, we basically have handshake um, reciprocal agreements that if something happens to you, you can certainly call our CISO. And, and so there is this network at that level that whether it's formalized or not, there's a brethren that are always willing to step up and to help each other. And that goes nationally as well. There's the National Association of State CIOs that works in this space as well, National Association of Cities. Everybody is, is recognizing this as an issue. So I think the main thing is to realize you're not an island. There's plenty of, of information out there and don't be afraid to ask. Um, and there are these resources that are available that most of them or a lot of them are free. Um, and as, as you mentioned, you know, get the card, make the contact before you have a problem because they're there to help you avoid the problem just as, just as much as they are to help you once something occurs. So you've been thinking sort of about taking us even beyond that to you know, collaboration between cities. What, what do you think the opportunities are for the future for um, bringing together pooling resources in order to meet some of these threats? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, it's not just collaboration between cities, which I'll, I'll touch on in a minute, but it's also, you know, from the state perspective, um, something that we're already seeing and, and then ways that we can take that further or, you know, county to county collaboration. Um, and a couple of things I, I want to talk to first are what's already, go, you know, going on right now, which is, you know, the availability of state level contracts for IT services or IT products that, you know, local governments can take advantage of because states, you know, by themselves or with other states have, you know, purchasing power um, that is way beyond what a local government would have. And, and so the pricing there is going to be very difficult, uh, different. And so having contracts that local governments can take advantage of, whether that's for incident response or for products, um, can really, you know, lower the burden on a local government to have to do that on their own or, or to, you know, pay for uh, services or, or products at a, a much higher premium. Um, now I, I also call out the, the program from Michigan where um, Michigan paid for uh, a cybersecurity uh, expert to do um, analysis on counties that wanted an assessment. Um, so we're able to, you know, use that that power from the state, you know, a little extra budget there um, as a pilot to to provide those services um, down to the you know the county or the local government level. Um, and, and something else, you know, encourage folks to to think creatively. Um, you know, especially when you're talking about smaller cities, smaller local governments, um, they probably don't have the money to employ a chief information security officer. But what, you know, multiple counties or multiple small cities may have the opportunity to do so. So to think about um, how to share not only resources, but personnel in this shortage of personnel time um, could, be, could be very, you know, an interesting platform to do. Um, as well, looking, you know, looking at a regional perspective. Um, sometimes states necessarily won't have the opportunity to all have the exact same expertise, but how do we, you know, through that development of exercises, through, you know, getting to know each other and, and making plans that are strategic in nature, be able to share resources at a, at a more regional level. Anything to, you want to come in on? Yeah, I just want to say, if I may add, and I just kind of wrap it up, this, this year, this, this November, there's going to be 39 gubernatorial elections. There's going to be 19 for sure that are term limited. So we're gonna looking at at least 19 new governors. That means there's 19 states that have their governors and all are trickle down where you have to re-educate them on cybersecurity. Now some are gonna come with different backgrounds, but there's also gonna be a learning curve. And I think that's where you have cities where they have mayors in place, where it's gonna be incumbent upon them to make that connection saying, hey, I'm here for you, here's what we've done. Here's what we did in the past that worked well. Here's something that maybe we can learn to do differently. Um, but I think that's going to be crucial. Going back to kind of threats for me, I think that's the biggest one is just make sure that we get everyone up to speed because the threats and the threat actors are, are going to still be pounding. Um, one final question before I open it up to the floor. Um, it is noticeable for very obvious reasons that uh, the 
state and local cybersecurity conversation has been sort of diverted uh, in the last couple of years into uh, a conversation about election security. For um, we don't need to have that discussion now. Other people uh, are discussing that. But but question for you: whether you think that is going to be a net positive or 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 a detractor from dealing with some of the other cyber threats. Is, is this going to be uh, something that to counterpoint, raises awareness, gets people engaged, or is there a limited amount of resource uh, and a, a danger that um, people uh, understandably focus on that at the expense of some of the other things we've been discussing? And I'll take first crack at that. And I think, you know, I, I think the answer is both, um, you know, for and it, some, some states, it depends on the, the actual governance structure that exists within the state. Um, if the, the, you know, the election infrastructure is very closely tied to the infrastructure for cybersecurity within the state, uh, that can be great for, for both sides and, and you know, enforces collaboration. And, and it's a way of increasing that communication between the local governments and the state governments, local governments and the federal governments. Um, in other states that may be two, two very separate forms of communication. And I've you know, already started to hear from folks that are saying, you know, we heard about this or they, they heard about this, but we didn't. Um, and, and having that push and pull um, between the, you know, the infrastructure that are, you know, support elections and the infrastructure that supports IT uh, within local governments and, and the state. But overall, I think it'll be a net bonus. You know, it, it increases the communication and increases um, the conversation around these threats. And it's at the fundamental level, it's cyber threats. There aren't different threats that are, you know, they're slightly different, but not really in terms of what's facing um, a local government, the election infrastructure, um, a you know, private sector company. Um, it, it, the, the high end of the threat, yes, maybe it's different, but at the, the low end, the targets of opportunity, it's, it's all the same. And so having that conversation, making sure, you know, as you were saying earlier, Karen, people are having this conversation. It's part of the discussion. I think that's a benefit for all of us. Yeah, no, um, I agree completely with that. I think it's really a net positive in that you're having conversations with stakeholders that weren't in existence before. That's happening now. Now we have really robust conversations. You now have um, election infrastructure designated as critical infrastructure. I know there's a lot of um, debate with that going beforehand as to the merits of that, but I think now people see the merits and the benefits of having it as that. And as a result, to Natasha's point, we see this as all interconnected. I think where I get frustrated is that everybody's talking about just election infrastructure. Don't forget that a, a, a malicious actor can target a transit system, like what happened in San Francisco, where they ransomware it, and you couldn't use the uh, transit system. If you do that on election day, then folks can't go to vote. So all the critical infrastructure is interconnected, and I think the more we have those conversations and the more we view it, as a whole ecosystem, and I think the better. So really, I think it's been a net positive. I'm gonna add just a little bit of that. Um, I think ultimately it will be a net positive. I think the last experience that we had though, um, everybody at the last minute decided they need to be a part of the election conversation. And so a lot of our elections officials, I think felt like, stop helping me, um, because they were so consumed with people who wanted to come and help with the presume situation that they were having a hard time actually carrying out the functions that they needed to for an election. So I think that's the, we have to avoid the, let's just pile more stuff on because more has got to be better. Um, because I think that becomes a real issue. Virginia actually decertified a whole host of, of voting machines because there was no paper trail. Um, we were very fortunate that we did that because we ended up with quite a few recounts had we not taken that step. But to your point, we had to work very creatively with the vendors of machines that did have the proper security to make sure that those localities and those mach machines were in place prior to the election because they didn't have the money just lying around to replace voting machines. So you have to look at budgets and you have to look at how things fit together. I think going forward, you know, we have to, we can't get, this can't be the bright shiny object that everybody focuses on. Security around elections is physical, physical security, it's accuracy, it's cybersecurity, it's a whole host of topics. And if we get fixated on just the cybersecurity elements, we're going to miss something else. And so it has to be viewed as part of a much bigger portfolio of cyber, I mean, portfolio of security 
where cybersecurity is one ongoing effort, just like everything else. Because the sanctity of the election, you know, all of this is built on trust for governments, whether it's federal, state, or local. Your citizen has to trust that they're participating in a system that will protect them and it will protect their rights. And voting is no different than protecting PII, you know, on any other given day. But I think we have to be careful not to chase the bright, the bright light, because if we focus too much on that, we're going to miss something somewhere else. And that's, those are equally important to what can happen in cyber. Anything else you want to add? Um, yeah, I'll just say the role of mayors and local officials now in this space is encouraging voters to still go out and vote and trust the system. Uh, and that's something, for example, that Mayor Garcetti has really pushed and making sure we're engaging uh, the local youth community and registering new voters. Uh, that's from, from the, city, the city's role in doing so. I would also, um, it, that, the answer to that question might also depend on the jurisdiction that the way Los Angeles works specifically is we do not run our elections. We provide those, I mean, those functions are part of the county and the state. So it might also have to do with who you ask. Um, we are constantly working with our county and state officials on election security. Uh, but again, it, it has to do with the jurisdiction. Um, I'm going to keep this conversation running uh, until about 4.45 with uh, people's permission because we lost a little bit of time in the middle. That gives us 20 minutes to pick up questions from the floor. So um, if you have a question, please sort of indicate. Uh, and uh, there are microphones uh, sprinkled around the room for people who uh, need to, um, who, who want to ask a question. Anybody, I have plenty of questions. Does anyone have any uh, questions they'd like to ask? Um, if you, there's a microphone just in front of you, uh, if you could um, press the button, say who you are and where you're from, and then ask your question. My name is Colleen Johnson. I'm from Sarah Brin, a cyber risk management firm. I have a question for um, Jacob of Los Angeles. Um, I was wondering how having Hollywood as a unique part of your constituency impacts your efforts to build a cybersecurity program as a public program, um, and if you know, particularly with the perspective is, you know, the American movie industry being a, um, considered a trophy, you know, a cyber attack trophy. Yeah. Hollywood is obviously the American uh, epicenter of, of uh, production, that's in Los Angeles. We regularly engage the industry, um, and one of the things I haven't touched upon yet is the LA Cyber Lab. And so before I answer your question, let me take one step back and just do a quick background on that. In August of 2017, so last year, Mayor Garcetti met with a group of information security professionals from about 30 different uh, private sector companies in Los Angeles that are headquartered in LA. Uh, and it was a, it's a cross-sector approach. We have companies from the entertainment industry, academia, healthcare, tech, critical manufacturing, et cetera, uh, represented on a, an advisory board that works with the mayor and the city government to exchange information, um, to work on workforce development programs and engaging stakeholders. So one of the communities as part of that is entertainment. And we work very closely, for example, with 21st Century Fox and Creative Artists Agency, um, just to name two. Uh, one of the things that they are really concerned about is supply chain, the supply chain security of their products. They, you know, movie industries, for example, they film a, a movie and what it goes to the distribution phase and the production phase. And um, one of the things they're concerned about are the leakings of films. Uh, so we are working very closely with them to, to engage them and provide them with the resources they need uh, to strengthen their community. That answers your question. Laura. Thanks. I was hoping we could return to a topic that we touched on very briefly before the intermission, as it were. Um, Karen, you had mentioned uh, some of the workforce development, and uh, you'd mentioned it as well a second ago. Um, it seems to me that uh, state and local governments are in a good position to make a virtue out of a necessity. 
uh, and, and really implement some innovative solutions. They're incentivized to, to deal with the scarcity by innovating. Um, and I have on occasion seen some areas, uh, either in their own workforce or working with local stakeholders, encourage things that we haven't seen other places. And we've really seen states and localities being some of the genesis of that. I'm curious what sorts of programs you've seen, what, what you've been involved with, um, what you've been interested or invested in bringing up in your own systems as well. I'll take first crack at that one. Um, there's a lot going on in education and it's really exciting. Um, in Virginia, we actually passed a, a law, it was done through the legislature, that computer science would be taught beginning basically in kindergarten and continue all the way through the, the K-12 experience. Um, I think the thing that is gonna be the game changer is industry relevance. Um, you've got to have industry experience and relevant hands-on experience before you can even compete in these arenas right now. Um, Virginia, Michigan has done this as well, has created a cyber range, um, which brings together a virtual world um, that includes curriculum, it includes red blue games, hands-on experiences, and it's available to all educators throughout the entire state. Michigan's the same way as we are. Um, and what that does is it levels the playing field. Each individual school doesn't have to go out and create a X type of lab in order to be able to do this. They don't have to necessarily have the number of professionals, teachers that understand how to teach cyber because there's a whole ecosystem, educational ecosystem wrapped up in this virtual environment that they can plug into. And so it saves them the, the pains of having to create unique curriculum. Um, industry partnerships, um, they're hungry for them. We've actually launched, um, and this is more on the veteran side of the house, but AWS, Microsoft, Cisco, and a whole host of others um, have come together to provide free training for veterans that are exiting the services. Um, that is a very unique model. They don't have to go to a four-year institution. They don't have to really participate in any traditional educational um, experience. They can simply go through the program. That consortium was set up, I believe, in 2013, 20, well, 2014, 2015, um, and is still in, in use today. Um, we're seeing much greater participation in things like Cyber Patriot, National Cyber Challenge, um, and again, it comes down to resources. Having the resources for the teachers, having the teachers be able to be trained, um, and we've got to start these students at as early a, an age as possible. So a lot of these competitions that are outside of a typical school day um, are where where we're hitting the biggest success, I hate to say it, traditional education is slow to change. Um, we can mandate, we can do a lot of things to try to force that, but it's, it's a slow process. And so we've done Life Journey, and I'm gonna cut this short, but um, there's a group out there that partnered with the national, um, I think it was NSA, um, to do something called Life Journey. The child or the person gets online, they can explore cyber careers, they can pick one that looks like them or feels like them, take it for a test drive, play some red blue games. SANS Institute is doing something similar. So we've got to find a way to engage and keep kids engaged uh, until, the, until the traditionals um, catch up because there are well-paying jobs that can be attained with just certifications. There are others that require an associate's degree. There are a lot that require a bachelor's degree but we've got to make sure that wherever that child decides to jump off the educational process and into a, into a work-a-day environment, that they have the credentials to do that. So I don't think we're done seeing hackathons, datathons, um, Girls Who Code. Um, all of those are, are providing very, very solid resources outside of the traditional educational space. Um, and I think people are finally recognizing that cyber is a career that is real. Um, so so many for so long it was NCIS and other shows on TV and mm -hmm. nobody knew how to get into it. But I think that conversation has changed. So we're seeing parents be pro more proactive and we gotta spend a little bit more time on our guidance counselors so that as they're channeling these kids into their career choices, they make sure that cybersecurity and, and the IT fields generally um, are part of that part of that conversation. Jacob, what's LA doing to 
build its workforce. Yeah, um, I'm glad Karen brought up the cyber range because we were recently, the Los Angeles Cyber Lab was awarded a $3 million Department of Homeland Security grant a couple of weeks ago to become uh, the Los Angeles ISAO, a regional information sharing and analysis organization uh, that is cross industry. And what some of that money is gonna go towards is developing a cyber range where we basically, the ISOC is sitting on all of this threat data that we collect from across the city, from all of our assets. We wanna make that threat data available to researchers, uh, undergraduates, graduate students to come in. Uh, we have, for example, students from CSU Dominguez Hills right now who are interested in building dashboards for our cyber threat analysts. Um, what would be really cool and ideal would be for them to build a threat model for us so that we can understand what the cyber threat is to the city. That's, for example, one thing that we'd like to do with that money. Um, we're working with the local universities around Los Angeles to place students in cybersecurity jobs. NICE in uh, NIST had a recent statistic that there's about 10 to 20,000 unfilled cybersecurity jobs in the Los Angeles Long Beach uh, urban area. So we really are we're working with career centers to, to introduce students to these positions in cybersecurity in LA. Um, we could go on and talk about sort of workforce for the, for the rest of the evening. And uh, Laura, who just asked that question, is uh, uh, shortly have a report out on, on cybersecurity workforce issues, which I uh, recommend to everyone. But um, just to stay sort of directly on topic, uh, conscious of our time, um, before we finish, I'd just like to um, ask uh, a question about public policy. Um, we're a public policy think tank. Uh, we're focused on um, coming up with ideas to improve uh, the way in which uh, we're governed at all different levels. Um, looking at sort of what you know, um, what are the, the both the, the opportunities for um, various different levels of government, either you know, federal government to help uh, uh, states and cities, or indeed uh, states to help cities, uh, or indeed uh, what are the opportunities where we, we've seen really good policies happening in isolated areas um, that can be elevated and, and brought to bear in other parts of the country? Um, Natasha. Sure, and, and I'm just gonna to highlight one. There, there's obviously an, a number, and, and the one I'm gonna highlight is, is the funding aspect. Um, and looking at how cybersecurity um, efforts are funded, particularly, you know, I'll just focus on the federal government side. Um, I, you know, tying it to Homeland Security grants has been beneficial in the past because it's a grant you know, vehicle that already exists. Um, and, and it ties itself to that concept that cybersecurity is an element of security. Um, I think there's a couple of fundamental problems with uh, the way that it's currently done. And, and one of those is it's tied to counterterrorism. terrorism um, Counterterrorism counter is obviously a threat. It's one that we face every, you know, every day in this country. Um, I would, I would hazard a guess that, you know, and, and uh, talk, talking to a number of folks that specialize on this, it's not the primary cybersecurity threat. And so tying um, the preparatory efforts and, and the funding efforts that we have in this country for cybersecurity assistance to state and local governments to a counterterrorism threat um, takes away from the actual priorities of what we should be doing to prepare as a country um, in a federal manner for cybersecurity threat. And so separating that funding out um, and tying it very closely to both the threat profile and also to the national priorities of what we need for recovery, what we need for security, what we need for resilience, um, would really help to put, put that roadmap out for state and local governments um, in terms of where they should, you know, where they can be going, where they should be going, um, and how to directly tie their efforts to the, the kind of funding that is available um, in, in a much more clear and, and, and directed manner. Michael, what's the policy opportunity or indeed policy that you'd like to highlight? Uh, I think policy opportunity, going back to the earlier conversation about smart cities, um, is really public safety technology. And I think there's two instances, instances and one is that um, states are rolling out next generation 911, which basically IP-based 911 systems where the callers can 
send data files to uh, responding officers. So think of texting, audio, visual, things of that nature. Now, now one truly is a local jurisdictional issue. Um, however, when it comes to next generation now one, it's the states that are rolling it out. So that's a good, great partnership right there and how the states can engage locals because uh, there's been instances where people are now attacking now one systems. And that's going to be the government's worst day when citizens can't call for government help. So that right there is a great opportunity. And secondly, um, public safety law enforcement is getting a wealth of information, whether it's through these 911 calls, whether it's through um, body worn cameras or any other kind of application that they have, they now have to manage that data and protect that data. So once again, there's an opportunity for state and local um, governments to uh, focus on that particular issue. Karen. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of public policy implications um, around cybersecurity. I think at some point we're going to have to normalize across the U.S. because right now what's happening is it, it's an evolution of a patchwork quilt. Um, every state is doing something different from everybody else, whether it's supply chain management. I know there are some bills that have come through on supply chain for the federal government. Um, slow to be adopted by the states, but if states can adopt like processes and procedures um, that are going through the federal government, like much like Natasha mentioned about the, the contracts that are shareable, if we can do the same with policy and reduce the patchwork nature of the policy so that we're much more unified, it's gonna make it easier for everybody to adhere, especially those that are providing goods and services if they don't have to look across, you know, however many jurisdictions, states, federal government, it's gonna be so difficult that there's gonna be very few that'll ever be able to qualify across. We've seen California, we've seen Europe come out with GDPR and other things that are, that are quite sweeping. I think it's gonna take us a while to get there as a nation. Um, but I think having that kind of, of aspirational goal that it's, it's unified, um, whether it's information sharing or whether it's you know, policy around securing devices, we've gotta to get to the point where we stop seeing the boundaries. The hackers don't see boundaries. Um, and so the more that we can unify ourselves under, under more clear and more succinct type policies, it'll be better for everybody. And where do you see the onus for that resting? Um, I think, you know, the federal government is going to have to step up. Now, preemption is a whole different conversation that we could have a whole different conversation around um, at some other point. But I think, I think there's going to have to be a leadership that says, you know, here are minimum standards. I know there's a lot of people working on such as NIST working on smart community standards and others, but we're gonna have to have those standards and policies just like NIST to develop the cybersecurity framework. Those at least provide a baseline starting point that we can have those conversations. And so there's gonna have to be leadership, I believe at the federal level, but to the extent that the states have already taken a leadership role, the more of, a, more of the states that can adapt, adapt to and adopt those same policies, procedures, and otherwise, it's gonna make it much easier for everybody. And it's gonna be, you know, possibly, you know, with NGA's help, um, if the states will go through and adopt, start to adopt it, then it's gonna happen from a grassroots level. You know, whether it's states or localities, once it starts and two, five, 10 adopt it, then it's much easier for the rest of them to fall into place. And so I think the federal government needs to step up and, and start they have, they have the biggest buying power of anybody. Maybe if the states all join forces, maybe we'd have a larger buying power, I'm not sure. But they also have a lot of areas of, of very distinct interests, such as DOD and the, and the products that they buy for them. They have a special interest in them being secure. So I think there's gonna have to be leadership from the top, um, and then the states are gonna have to find their way to participate in that. But I would think that putting together a group much as was mentioned before that involves city leadership as well as state leadership as well as federal to evolve those policies would be a much smarter way than doing it in any one vacuum um, and perhaps you know you would like to host those kinds of discussions <laughs> <laughs> around always, that multi-level but I, I think that's you know the collaborate it's going to have to be collaboration but there's going to have to be leadership and somebody's going to have to take the first step 
Jacob, I'm going to give you the last word. So it's a two-part question. What, what would you, what enabler would you most like to see in order for you to yeah. do what you need to do for the people of Los Angeles? And, and what is the thing that, that you have learned, perhaps the hard way, that you think could be most useful for, for other cities around the United States? Okay, sure. Uh, well, so first policy would be separate funding that is not tied to counterterrorism. So I agree with Natasha. The second policy that I would like to see a push towards is mutual aid agreements between cities. Um, we in Los Angeles, for example, have that expertise when it comes to cyber incident response. And when Atlanta, for example, was hit with a ransomware attack in March, our CISO was the first one out there to make sure that uh, Atlanta CISO was able to respond and recover from the incident. I want to see more official mutual aid agreements between strong cities that have expertise in cybersecurity, but also cities and smaller, smaller jurisdictions that really don't. And same thing with states, state to state support, federal to state support. I think there needs to be a, a stronger framework for mutual aid. Um, so to the second point, what's something I learned? What, what do you think LA has to teach the, the rest of the country? Mm. Be ambitious, of course. Um, obviously, if you dream it, it's something that we want, that you want to be true, but uh, so that's actually a tough question. Um, keep in mind, obviously, the cybersecurity impacts of every policy that, that you do, whether it's a physical policy like transportation and traffic, um, how do we help the homeless, homeless in our cities? I think you always need to think of every policy issue from a cybersecurity perspective, because there's always some type of nexus that could, could occur. So uh, New America, of course, has a, an office in California. So I, I look forward to continuing this conversation, perhaps in, in LA, uh, in, in due course. But for now, um, we could continue this conversation, but I'm very conscious of people's time. So uh, thank you for those people who stuck with us online. Particularly thank you for uh, the people in the room who uh, stuck with us through the interruption. Uh, it just remains for me uh, to ask you to join me in thanking our fantastic panel, uh, 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 Natasha Cohen, Michael Garcia, Karen Jackson, and Jacob Finn. Thank you very much.